Okay, welcome everyone to my lecture on pure tone air and bone audiometry. If you're wondering why I come to you wild eyed and wild haired, if I reuse this video for posterity's sake, I am staring down the barrel of Hurricanes Marco and Laura and wondering what our lives are. Um, so, Let's just dive right in and see what we come up with. So first things first, should a hurricane or any other natural disaster come, odd sim or sim a, similar, a similar simulation is going to become super, super important to all of us. So as soon as you watch this, or maybe even pause in watching this if you're still in 2020, go ahead and download this. This is a component of your clinic requirements. It's assignments. It's what you're going to do if you have to do makeup time. This is important. Let me just adjust this out. There we go. Um, it's like $20, and when you download it from oddsim.com, you will need to register it. You'll have a four-digit local key that you'll use, and you'll put your first and your last name in it. Now, it is important that you not use any hyphens or anything. No hyphens or special characters. None of that, because it will act very, very badly. It's also important that you use for the submission email, audiology at lamar.edu. Probably should have typed that so you could see it a little bit better, but audiology at lamar.edu is the submission email the submission email. That's what you'll put in there. So let's talk a little bit about how you read an audiogram and what it kind of means. It's a graph that is plotted with regards to both pitch or hertz frequency and decibels. And typically, most American audiograms are going to be zero to 120 and 125 to 8,000 Hertz. Now that's evolving a little bit and you do have high frequency headphones that go above 8,000 Hertz and increasingly software is taking advantage of that the technology is taking advantage of that so our four of our audiometers can actually go further out to 20,000 hertz now that's limited reliable not reliability it's limited utility because 20,000 hertz we can only actually um, test it like 510 decibels but it's interesting data and again like I said the hearing aids and the software is starting to take advantage of that here are some examples of audiogram sim symbols you mark most audiologists mark Red is for right, blue is for left, circles for right, X is for O. Masking, of course, is the triangle here versus the square. Um, there are a few Jurger followers, Jurger devotees, who do the split audiogram. And if you're looking in the files, we did that for a while, so you will encounter them. Ben Taub in Houston. Most of the ones that still do split audiograms are in Houston. So let's talk about how do you remember how the, the symbol change from air conduction to masked from unmasked air conduction to masked air conduction. And this is how I remember it. If the unmasked is a circle and you squish it, you can get a triangle. If it's an X, if you unfold it, you have a box. You may have something else that works for you. 
Now, the unmasked or masked bone conduction, what you're going to want to do is think of them as ears, and they're ears, and so you draw a face, and it's looking at you, and so the one on your left is the right symbol. Now, it's important to remember that face goes in the middle because if you have an audiogram, and let's say that's 500 hertz, and you want to draw the symbol, you need to have it on opposite sides. You know what would have been really helpful? If I switched my color so it made sense, huh? There we go. That's helpful because you need to picture that face in the middle. Red face, actually. Right there, right? So the ears are on the other side. You may also hear me say alligator mouth, monster mouth. That's like a thing I tend to do when I stumble over my words. Now, any of these symbols, any of them, can have these arrows drawing down, and that means no response at the limits of the equipment. So you hear me say masking, masking, masking. Well, what masking is, is it's that you keep the non-test ear busy while testing the opposite side. And We'll do this normally if I'm doing this in person, I have this whole shtick with some objects and I have a person stand up and I throw something at them and they catch it, right? And when you catch something, just like when you're catching sound, both sides go to try and do it, right? But if I give you something to hold in one hand like this, right? You're holding it in this hand and then I throw something at you to catch, you're going to usually just use one hand. And that's kind of what masking is. The idea of it is to leave one side holding the bag so that you can work with the other one. We have two whole sections on that, though. We will go deeper into masking. The other thing I want you guys to be aware of is there are about as many ways to mask as there are people who do it. And what we're going to explore and focus on a lot is the math and the science and physics behind it so you understand why most of those ways work and when is a good time to use a particular shortcut versus not such a great time. But if you don't get it right off the bat, that's okay. Lots of people struggle with masking. It's really pretty common. It's one of the more abstract things we do because it is so variable. Personally, I was several years out and have had graduated and had been successfully masking for years before I finally had those dumb moments where I was like, oh, that's what's doing it. Dr. Dawkins can tell you a similar one. She like had like a thing in the middle of an appointment, like an epiphany, epiphany that like startled her into saying something even out loud. So don't feel discouraged if you don't get masking right away because you'll get it eventually. Now, Odd Sim will probably help because you can practice the masking ones as often as you want on your own time and it gives you feedback. So, this is a normal, normal audiogram, or is it? What do you know? What do you not know? Well, right now, all we know is bone conduct, I mean, air conduction scores. So theoretically, we could have some bone conduction scores up here and here, and it might not actually be so very normal. Okay, let's define threshold. Threshold is the softest sound that you can detect at least 50% of the time with a particular transducer. Um, 
Most transducers are ear specific. Sound field is not. Sound field is the better ear and so is what else? Any takers? Any guess? Bone. Bone is also not ear specific, but at least bone, it can be. How can we make bone ear specific? By masking. Can we make sound field ear specific? Well, certainly not with masking because the masking would be going to both ears at the same time too. Um, potentially you can a little bit. Um, you can with um, by plugging one ear up or if you were doing aided testing by only doing one ear at a time, a little bit. But mostly sound field is not ear specific. And what are we measuring it with? Well, normally we're measuring it with pure tones, but technically you can measure it with any sound. Air conduction testing is sound that is coming through the air, funneled in through your pinna, down your canal, hitting your eardrum. That's air conduction, and we can use tuning forks, we can use earphones, we can use sound field. Specific kinds of air conduction earphones are the super aural headphones, um, and those sit on the ears. They push on the pinna. Now, what you want to go do is look in the clinic um, team and in the clinic one there is videos on how to put on different transducers so after you finish this video if you haven't already move over to those videos and check that out but there are a variety of pluses and minus to the super aural headphones they are widely considered I wouldn't say the gold standard, but the most common standard, the reference standard. And that's because that's what we started out with. Those were the original style. So that's what we compare everything against. Um, they're relatively inexpensive, comparatively speaking. They're very sturdy. They keep calibration well. And they're good for even um, malformed or deformed ears. But if you don't get them on just exactly so, the sound can leak out and sound is pressure. You want to take this down, sound is pressure. That is going to come out of my mouth regularly because it it's, it's so fundamental to everything we're gonna be talking about with regards to testing, with regards to hearing in space, not like outer space, but like in a given room with regards to hearing aids. Sound is pressure. So if pressure escapes out, the intensity will be different. And also if an ear canal volume size is different than expected, that's also going to impact the pressure, impact the intensity. So it's important to keep that in mind because it helps you make decisions. The next type is circumaural headphones, and that's the kind I'm wearing right now. And they go all the way around and completely encase the pinna. You're going to most often see these with... Um, extended or high frequency one. I honestly don't know why they're not more popular. They are slightly more um, expensive than the, the super aural ones, but they don't press down and compress the penna. They're much less likely to um, cause like have sound escaping or to compress the penna. They're more comfortable to most people. They block out more background noise. Um, so there's a lot of benefits. And because they weren't first, I guess, I don't know. They're just not as popular. I kind of prefer them. Oh, well, the other problem is, is they don't tend to have as adjustable of headbands. 
but I don't know. They're good. I like them a lot. Not as much as insert earphones, but quite a lot. Oh, and obviously, there's sanitation issues with headphones either way. That's a lot of contact. You're not throwing anything away um, with it. You can do um, headphone covers, at least with the Circum RL one. I mean, the Super RL ones, but those do add up in price over time. Insert earphones are probably my favorite ones. Um, yes, they can be a little uncomfortable, but then so can the Super Aural ones squishing your head. Um, they have the best noise exclusion, the best um, interaural attenuation, but they're tricky. If you do not get them in, let me highlight this real quick so you can see. If you do not get them in and they're not countersunk, as you will see as I discuss in the how to put on transducers video, then you're not getting the results you think you are. And again, sound is pressure. And so these are calibrated to assume there is very little residual ear canal volume between the end of it and the tympanic membrane. So, if you don't have it in as deep, you will have less pressure, which means less intensity, which means inaccurate low frequency thresholds. You're also not getting the, redu the better inaural attenuation and reduced um, occlusion effect that you're expecting, so it can throw you off. Additionally, insert earphones for diagnostic purposes are inappropriate if your ear canal volume is larger than expected. And that can come from surgery, it can come from a hole in the eardrum, that's going to be a bigger space, which is going to be less pressure, which is going to be less intensity, which is going to make your low frequencies appear artificially worse than they're supposed to. That's kind of a misnomer, I guess, because we're comparing it to what we're used to, which is headphones. So if we'd started with insert earphones to start with, we would think of that as the right way to start with, but we didn't. So it's just a matter of physics though. When you're doing something, Think about what you're doing and interpret the values based on the situation that you're in, and it's correct. So, for instance, I may, for diagnostic purposes, on a mastoid bowl, um, a mastoidectomy patient, do headphones. I might repeat this test with inserts if I was using values to fit a hearing aid because the hearing aid is going to more be more similar to how the responses are with the insert earphones. So test with purpose. Think about what you're trying to accomplish and interpret everything in that lens. Now headphone position does matter quite a bit. Um, you might want to check out that um, because of the way I am recording this. I can't just pull that up, but I do recommend you go check that out if you want to see th scientists throwing shade at each other. I think that's this one. And then also remember, what is sound? Sound is pressure. If I ask you what is sound, I need you to respond, call back, sound is pressure. Um, if you want to know why that is or more of the physics check out Boyle's law and you can get some basic information here there is also a resource in the EBP manual and the clinic manual that's kind of an acoustic psychoacoustics audiology online if your physics class was not real great on this or if you took chemistry instead of physics but Learning about the physics of sound is going to help you tremendously, not just this year, but the rest of your career as an audiologist. So it does matter, though, which transducer you pick. For instance, tuning forks, as you'll learn in the CATS handbook, they can do some, they can do a little bit for screening, but they're not intensity specific. 
TDH headphones, TDH39, they're the most common, particularly in ENT offices, because they are inexpensive. They don't have on as many ongoing costs. They're good for perforations or post-surgical ears, which ding, 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 lots of those in the ENT. ER, um, ER3 or ER3A ones, um, better interaural attenuation when you use proper insertion depth, no collapse in canals, better noise exclusion, um, more sanitary because you're throwing those inserts away. It's easier to mask bone conduction because you're not trying to figure out how to place them. So there's pluses to it. The circumaural ones or the high frequency ones, they are, again, better noise exclusion, a little more comfortable, way harder even than the TDH 39s to do um, bone conduction because bone conduction we very much usually do mastoid and where is this sitting? Hey, on my mastoid. So you really have a lot of, it's really not too easy to do um, bone conduction with the um, circumoral headphones. Um, you have to mostly do forehead ones. Now, I think the only audiometer that we have that is calibrated for forehead and you have to make sure you switch the little switch is the newest um, GSI because we have the AM TAS, which is an automated system and it uses circumoral headphones with forehead bone and the patient can test themselves. And then sound field is not ear specific, but if for some reason you can't put any sort of headphones on a patient or you're testing hearing aids, then sound field is your choice. So think about what you're trying to find out and what you're trying to mimic and what the acoustics of the situation are to do it. Like start to finish, think about it from multiple levels. For instance, if I have mild, moderate or more wax, should I use inserts? No, because it's going to plug them up and then I'm getting invalid results. What did I say about having a perforation? Which transducer should I use? Should I use ER3A? Should I use inserts? Hmm? Well, it depends on what I'm doing with it. But for diagnostic purposes, no, because I'm going to get much worse low frequency results than I'm expected. And the fun thing about that, and I have an article, so ask me about that if you want it, which you're probably going to want it, but it is actually the amount that the low frequency thresholds will be worse is inversely proportionate to the size of the middle ear space, which you can estimate with tympanometry. So normal tympanometry caps out at about 1.8 cc's, cc cubed, I think, so weird to try and remember some of these things that you're used to looking at when you talk at about it. But so that's like 1.8 is normal. And if it's like 2.6, 2.4, 3.2, like a small amount, you're going to have a big, much bigger than the 60 dB air gap you're expecting. On the other hand, if it's like 7.2, it might be relatively small. So inversely proportionate, which is all kinds of weird and my understanding of physics is not all that great to be able to explain that well to you. But I do have the article on that if you are curious. Or if you have a patient or um, a fake patient, one of your disorders that has a um, perforation, it'll help you decide how much hearing loss they, ha they have. Now, bone conduction, you can obtain speech awareness thresholds or speech recognition thresholds with them. And if you dig all the way back to the CATS 4th edition, I want to say, the Purple 4th edition CATS book, they actually recommend that for determining masking for speech. And it takes a lot of time, extra time, and so people kind of didn't, and it came out. But um, mainly, bone conduction is for pure tones. It is very important for determining middle ear status, and also very important for determining fistulas, and especially superior canal dehiscence. Um, and it is the part that surgeons like to claim that they can fix. Now, uh, 
Success with that is variable, but it's a gross way to say it. If there's an air bone gap, that is a part that a physician may be able to at least partially resolve. resolve. Now, it can be tested on infants if they can hold their heads up for behavioral or for evoked potentials, but otherwise not so much with the babies. Why? Because the babies are squishy and stretchy and also if they're touching. Now, again, you'll hear me talk more about that in the transducers video that you should go watch about what the hierarchy of needs are. But the big one is nothing is touching the bone conduction transducer. So what does ASHA say? What is, what is the, the methodology for finding threshold that ASHA recommends? Well, you can go here for their policy, um, but their deal is to familiarize by presenting a tone louder than threshold to get a response that the tone duration needs to be one to two seconds. So for the GSI 61 with pulsed, it's 200 milliseconds on, 200 milliseconds off. The Asteras, it's 225 milliseconds on, 225 milliseconds off. That's the default. You can change that. So if you were with me for um, hearing screening, that's why I like to use pulsed because you can count like four pulses. And if you math that out, you'll see you get one to two seconds. So you really don't want to do more than three, four pulses. Um, so definitely pulses are better. Also, if you have tinnitus like I do, I can say anecdotally, it makes it easier to hear and understand. Um, and then you'll hear a lot about modified Houston-Westlake procedure. And then we use it to find threshold by down 10, up 5, down 10, up 5 to find that place where 50% of the time they hear it, 50% of the time they don't. If they're hearing it at a given, thre a given stimulus 100% of the time, are they really listening and saying yes for the very softest one they can hear? Maybe not so much. So does ASHA really say the modified Houston-Westlake procedure? Eh, not so much. They actually recommend ascending. So they say give them an example and then drop below and come up. And it's still down 10 up 5. But most people just start at 30 or 50 if they assume hearing loss and then do the down 10 up 5. Um, descending. Um, the difference in effect for these methods are good to look at, so there are some articles for that. Um, but most of the time, for most compliant adults, descending is going to be fine. If you suspect a malingerer, which is a liar, which is a cheater, um, don't ever call somebody a liar or a cheater to their face. Um, be careful about throwing around, around malingerer, malingerer too. Um, you want to do ascending, though. It's easier to catch them. But most people, descending works just fine. So we start at 1,000 hertz. Why? Because it's the beefiest beep beep that ever beep beeped. Um, no, it's psycho. It's psychoacoustical effects. They they that is the most simple. That seems to be the most recognizable one for most. Unless, of course, you know they have like profound hearing loss, and then a, and then like a corner audiogram, something like that. Then starting at 250 kind of can help. 250 if all they have is low frequency. Because why are you going to do one, two, three, four, six, eight? and then retest 1,000, that is required. And then 500 hertz and 250, um, you're gonna be doing all of these that they can't hear only to come back and do that. Um, so I make a big deal of that because I do actually see more of the profoundly deaf population on campus. Um, but most patients, it's gonna be 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 6,000, 8,000. Now, depending on where you were at and how how old, the, I hate to say how old the audiologist, but how old fashioned the audiologist is, they may not have required 
3,000 or 6,000 routinely. That has been the policy, the requirements since about 2004. So if you, for some reason, are out of the habit of doing that and you were only doing them when there was a 20 dB or more difference between octaves, you need to get into the habit of doing it now because those are very important for um, for noise-induced hearing loss, for tracking that, for tracking asymmetries and high frequencies. 3,000 and 6,000 hertz are required always except for like small children where you're just trying to get it, like skip and fill those back in. Now, the other thing that some people do differently is 500 hertz and 250 hertz there. Um, textbook is to, after you retest 1,000 hertz, at least on the first year, to do 500 and then 250, to be perfectly frank, I do retest 1,000 and then tend to do 250 and 5 so that I'm closer to 1. It's kind of just a quirk of mine. Um, I've never seen anybody get too, too mad about that. Now, another thing that people don't always do but that I highly recommend, especially if you're going to be fitting hearing aids, is if there's any low-frequency hearing at all, add 125 hertz because that's an important one for occlusion effect and patient comfort and noise experience. And if you know you're going to be working with um, hearing aids that have a bunch of channels, especially if you know what the frequency bands are for the hearing aids, you may want to add 750 and 1500 hertz, even if there's not 20 dB difference between the octaves. And then bone, it's going to be 1,000 hertz, 2,000 hertz, 4,000, retest 1,000, and then 500 hertz. Now, those retests, you really only have to do the first, the first year. Um, you can on the second year, it's just not required. And the reason for this is it's all part of psychophysical adaptive techniques, and it kind of just makes everything check out, cross-check. Now, bone conduction, people fight about 250 hertz a lot, and we'll talk more about this on bone masking, but they say 250, but there's a lot of variance in that. The um, standard deviation for what's normal and how much is going on with 250 is quite high, plus, it has um, the lowest vibrotactile response. So 25 decibels and people will feel it. And non-deaf people are not particularly good at determining whether they're feeling or hearing things. Um, so depends on what you're looking for. So for a superior semicircular canal dehiscence, I'm definitely going to check it if I suspect it, because if it's like negative 10 and I've got 40 dB thresholds for air, it really kind of brings home the point. If it's a kid that I expect to have very good ones or I'm trying to like check, I might do it if my air conduction thresholds are 25 dB or better and I'm looking for why they're feeling clogged up, I'll do it then. But if everything's worse than 25, I might not. And then it's very important to um, start with the better ear. Why are we starting with the better ear? Because we need to know what's going on for masking, all right? So better ear first all the time. So what, how does ASHA define threshold? The threshold of hearing is defined as the lowest decibel hearing level at which responses occur in at least one half of a series of ascending trials. The minimum number of responses needed to determine the threshold of hearing is two responses out of three presentations at a single level. So pulled that and they pulled that from the ANSI standards from 2004. They do not have to be consecutive. So, and statistically, it's likely they would not be consecutive. 
Also note that minimum is not maximum, so if you have high degree of variability, you might look for whichever one is three times. You might look for three times. So you might have responses that go like this, and you're looking for right there. There's your three, right? Actually, it should have been, that whole thing should have been reversed. I'm so bad at drawing these things. Get, use the eraser. Not entirely sure why that stuck. Um, anyway, so if we have zero, 20, that sort of thing, 30, what we might have is we start here and they give us a yes, and they give us a yes and they give us a no. Neither of these count. Then we would go up five, and they give us a yes. So we go down 10, and it's a no, and it's a no, and it's a yes. There's your two out of three. We don't even need to do a third one, right? But if it wasn't so consistent, you might do a couple of more runs. But you're not, you don't need to get them two in a row like that. So let's try. One that's less consistent. So we start at 30 and they give us a yes. We start at, we pre present it at 20 and they give us a yes. We present at zero and they give us a no. So we go up and they give us a yes. So we go down 10 and we're at negative five now and it's a no and zero's a no and five's a no. And this time we've got <clears throat> Y'all want to laugh at me and how much I can't count? 10, 30, 20, 10. That might be helpful, right? Let's start that over again. My apologies. So 30 is a yes. 20 is a yes. 10 is a no. 15 is a yes. 5 is a no. Zero is a no, or 10 is a no, 15 this time is a no. Do you ever just feel like you can't draw for the life of you on a given day? 10 was a no, 15 was a yes, 5 was a no, 10 was a no, 15 is a no, 20 is a yes. How many yeses do I have that I can count? And your first instinct is to say two, right? But descending ones don't count, only ascending ones. So now we have a 15 and we have a 20. So we would go down 10, which puts us at 10 and it's a no. And then 15, what is it? Okay, let's say it's a yes. Well, there's our two out of three trials for 10, I mean 15. So our threshold here is 15. And I'm tired and I hope I didn't just confuse you. And if you're super confused, just ignore that, wipe it out of your brain and go do a couple of odd sims or practice ones with odd sims. And you can practice this threshold search. So. If there's a better ear, you may need to do masking. How much of a better ear does it matter? Well, that is determined by interaural attenuation. And interaural attenuation is actually a range. It is frequency specific. There are standard deviations, but those are all a little bit hard to remember and keep track of. And also you need to catch most everybody. So while 
interaural attenuation with headphones is actually more like 48 to 60. We use 40 with headphones to determine to decide when to mask. Now, you say headphones and you think, oh, headphone to headphone. But actually what we're worried about is the sound traveling through the skull through bone conduction. So what you're actually needing to compare it to is one ear's headphone score to the other ear's bone conduction score, or at least your assumed bone conduction score. So again, 40 with headphones, and that's for speech or for pure tones. Then inserts, inserts people want to fight about. So you'll see people say 70, you'll see people say 80, you'll see, see people do 40, you'll see people say 60 or 65 or 55. What's the real answer? Depends on which research article you're on. Now, I tend to use 75 from the low frequencies through 1,000 hertz, and then anything above 1,000 hertz, I'm currently using 50 because the articles I read, that makes the most sense to me. Um, but there is not yet consensus on that, so you better have a reference to back yourself up if somebody asks me. Um, Personal note on this, if it's only like a 15 dB air bone gap, something small, and temps and reflexes are normal, and I'm not worried about a superior canal dehiscence and there's nothing like that, I tend to be a little more lenient because even if I had an air bone gap of 15 decibels at a, a single frequency, it's not going to change my um, diagnosis, um, but Test retest is plus or minus five. So there's some variance in there, which I just realized I was supposed, I didn't actually say bone masking first. So you mask with bone when there is a 10 dB or a greater than 10 dB difference, depending on who you ask. Me, I use greater than 10 dB because again, plus or minus five, if there's only a 10 dB difference, mm, that's still pretty close in that plus or minus five there. Um, so that's another thing. When would you consider it a um, air bone gap? So I would say 15 dB or greater for me. Other people are more strict on that. All right, let's look at a nice little chart about um, noise exclusion, comparing how much background noise is excluded when you have ears, earphones or headphones on two ears. And if you'll notice the TDH50, which is one of the super aural ones, it's only excluding like 5 dB of no background noise, environmental noise to about 22-ish. Whereas the inserts, when deeply inserted, are excluding more background noise. So you're more likely to not be impacted by environmental noise with the inserts. Let's talk about insert interaural attenuation. This is a chart that it shows you TDH39, which are very, very similar to the TDH50. Um, and... That's what I was saying. It's like 48-ish for most people. And actually, it's more like 60, a little bit more even. But we say 40 for when we start to mask so that we catch everybody. And we try to mask even if it looks like we shouldn't be able to because we know we may actually have 20 dB more of padding just if somebody because or 20 dB or more of padding because the real interaural attenuation may be much greater. And then the inserts when deeply inserted 90 ish 90 and then rising to 70. So if I'm saying I decide 75 through a thousand and then 50 for the rest of it, you can see how I'm catching most everybody. Now, if you look at a different um, article, you may see different numbers. So this is actually from the Killian article. But insertion depth does matter. So that hole, it needs to be kind of countersunk. If you 
have both ear tips shallow, it drops significantly, especially at 500 hertz and 1,000. And which frequencies are we most worried about it? Low frequency, usually big conductive losses, 500 hertz and 1,000. If they're both deep, you've got a huge amount of interaural attenuation. So it's very important how you put that in there. So what is bone conduction interaural attenuation? Well, it's assumed to be zero because you are directly vibrating the skull. And how are we worried about the sound traveling when we're talking about interaural attenuation? It's through the skull. Also, let me pause for a minute and kind of update or refresh what your interaural attenu what the definition of interaural attenuation is. It is attenuation is how much sound is blocked. When we wear earplugs, it's to attenuate the sound. So interaural attenuation is not how much crosses over, it's how much the skull blocks from crossing over. So again, bone we assume, we assume, let's try that again, we assume an interaural attenuation of zero. So that's a good starting point for deciding when to mask. It is not a good starting point for thinking, oh, it doesn't matter where I put the transducer. I'm going to call it something else. Now, if you've ever observed somebody, I can almost guarantee you, you have seen somebody put a transducer on the left side, set up for masking on the right side, mark whatever they got on the left side as unmasked for the right side, and then go on about their day, which is a pet peeve of mine. Because interaural attenuation is not actually zero. And for me, at least, that's part of what made masking take so long for me to understand it. Because I was told interaural attenuation is zero. And then I would try things, and I would do things, and I would discover like things weren't working out. So then I was at a presentation for um, bone anchored hearing aids. And that's such a pervasive thought that when they were working on them, they were getting things that they didn't expect. And then somebody pulled up some research, um, Nolan and Lyon from, you know, 1981, where they actually assessed how much is the attenuation with bone conduction. And let me assure you, definitely not zero. So here are some of the controversies that we'll talk about and you need to consider when making choices. One, by definition, an unmasked bone conduction threshold should also be unoccluded, which means the other ear should not have anything in it. It should be all by itself. Also, unmasked thresholds should only be marked on the side that the oscillator is on if you're using mastoid placement. If you don't, people can't replicate your results. Now, ASHA standards also indicate that when masking, only a single side should be occluded. Why? What did I say about which kind of air conduction transducer came first? It was supraural headphones, right? You can't put a supraural headphone on and a um, bone oscillator on at the same time. They're going to touch. So that's really why. So with inserts, we actually could put, leave the inserts in on both sides. So then the question is, well, should we? Well, this is the reference. Please read that article. I actually, like if, I'd have, if I was any kind of researcher who actually did research and participated and wasn't scared to death of doing it, I would have done this decades ago. But so they did some research on it and they showed actually leaving both the inserts in is no different than leaving one insert in. So if you're going to leave one in, you might as well leave both in. The problem is, is that 
individual specific occlusion effects are necessary for to know for proper masking. So if you're leaving them both in, you don't you're not actually calculating their real occlusion effects and that can give you some inaccurate results. It's common that people don't can, don't actually calculate individual specific occlusion effects though. So We'll see how this evolves. This is pretty recent, only 2018, so we haven't really had enough time for people to decide how they're going to use that data. But if you're in the Facebook groups and people ask about it, you'll see me throw that down on the topic frequently because I know a lot of people who are giving people crap for doing that don't collect their own um, ear, ear in, or person-specific occlusion effects. So how are we supposed to know if the patient heard it though? We've got all this stuff in, we're down 10 up five, we're Houston Westlake modified system. We know we need to get two to three responses. How are they supposed to respond? Well, whatever you pick, it needs to be overt. They need to participate in the process. They need to either raise or lower a hand, arm or finger. They need to press a button. They need to verbalize. There is some research on this, actually. I encourage you to go read them. Um, they did find that patients preferred pressing the button and that it was faster. However, like if I'm going to quibble on it, I would also point out they didn't take into account sanitizing the button. So the amount of time that it was quicker actually um, was about the same as the amount of time it would take to sanitize it. So what are you winning? Um, for me, I prefer verbalizing. It is just as accurate. It's only slightly less fast. If you have tinnitus, it kind of breaks up the quiet, um, which is why I prefer it even when I'm testing the person, because if I sit there in the quiet, it makes me want to like rip my ears out from the tinnitus getting louder. Um, other people prefer raising hand or lowering arm, hand, or finger. Personally, that's exhausting to me, so I don't like to do it. Um, if somebody has arthritis and is obviously not moving very well, you shouldn't recommend it. Um, consider your patient, though. If somebody's panting for breath while talking or they have extreme hoarseness or they're just not verbal, obviously don't ask them to verbalize, like amend it. Look at who your patient is as a person, but you're going to develop preferences. The other reason I like verbalizing is because when I'm writing, I don't have to watch. Um, I can just write. I will also mention on the pressing the button thing most buttons are connected to the audiometer so some of them have a flashy light you have to watch some of them make a noise um, some people just hand people a pen and let them click the pen and they listen for the click um, it just has to be overt the other thing I do want to mention, though, on pressing the button is if you're testing a bunch of people who have been in the military or who have worked at pl plants, they have had a lot of button tests and they go a little button crazy. So you may want to change because of that. Um, there are the three basic types of hearing loss, conductive, sensory, neural, and mixed. Um, if we're looking at an audiogram for conductive hearing losses, we would expect bone to be normal and air to be abnormal, right? Like this. If it's sensory neural, we would expect the bone to be abnormal and the same as the air. And what's mix? It's splitting the different. Everything is abnormal, but there's still the gaps. If you're kind of confused and struggling on this, A, we're going to be doing this a bunch, but also just shout out some questions.
Now let's talk about degrees of hearing loss and how we describe them. There is some um, disagreement. You're going to get tired of hearing me say there's some disagreement, but there is. There's almost always some disagreement in audiology. Um, this is my preferred way. I like it to be nicely defined out. More categories. I like that. Other people would say that slight, sorry, that slight and normal, jeez Louise, why can I not hit the right pen? There we go. Slight and normal are all in the same thing for adults. They would say that slight is only for children. And then other people would combine moderately severe and severe. And so sometimes there's a little bit of adjustment or variability for there. Now let's talk about where we even get DBHL from. What happened is, is in the 30s, they took a bunch of, they went to, they like gathered people at a state fair in the 30s in Wisconsin. They took a bunch of white young farm boys who had never really been in the city before the industrialization of the farming community and tested a bunch of them and said, well, this is what normal hearing is. White 20 something males from Wisconsin. We could argue all day about how extendable that is, but then that's how we got what for switch from DBSPL, which is a physics sort of thing, scale to a norm human reference scale. Now, where this 25 came from, I'm going to be perfectly honest. I've never actually got this full study. I can't ever, I've never found anybody who could find the actual data. I cannot see what the standard deviations and how they calculate it to decide it what the normal distribution. So normal curves, distribution curves look something like that, right? And then you have kind of the center of it, and then you have standard deviations, right? Now, almost every scale I've ever seen has negative 10. Negative 10 as the bottom, right? So my feeling, like emotionally opinion, is that probably the standard deviation was from negative 10 to 10. So that's part of why I'm more comfortable with calling 15, 0 to 15, part of the normal, and then slight. Also, if you look at a speech banana, you're going to see that you're missing some consonants in that 16 to 25 dB range. So... I would assume if we were developed, if we if we evolved to hear and take those sounds in our communication, that it would be quote unquote normal um, for us to hear them. That's just me though. But the research on that, like I would pay literal money if you can ever find the actual full on original 30s data for how um, the HL HL scale was normed. I would pay you real dollars. So let's talk about normal hearing. Um, you will see people very frequently call it normal hearing loss. There's no such thing as normal hearing loss. So just be careful. Normal hearing sensitivity is how you're going to want to phrase it in a report. Okay, so now we've got, you've got some scales for how to describe it. So you would say in your report, pure tone audiometry shows or revealed, and yes, I know that's anthropomorphic and not grammatically correct. It is just conventional in uh, audiology to say that. So, norm, so pure tone audiometry shows mild, moderate, severe, the next word we're looking for is the descriptor, the configuration. So mild, sloping to severe, sensory neural hearing loss in each ear, never bilaterally. If you didn't test them together, don't say by anything. You need to say in each ear or describe them separately. So you have 
moderate rising to normal sensory neural or conductive hearing loss. So what's missing in here to tell us? Bone conduction, right? So we need bone conduction scores to finish it out. But that's the convention is to describe it as the start of the slope or the start of or the low frequency sounds what it is and then describe which direction it's going and then sensory neural conductive or mixed and then describe the other ear if it's not. And if it's unilateral or asymmetric, you can throw that in there too. So let's talk about what you would expect for your disorder so far. If it's a cholesteatoma, what anatomy is being broken? It's middle ear space, right? What about otosclerosis? the middle ear space. So at the very least, you're gonna have bone conduction scores, you're gonna have an air bone gap, and then depending on what else is going on, you're going to expect either normal or abnormal bone. Now, I want to point out that I am requiring you to do a mixed hearing loss for your otosclerosis patient because I need you guys to understand that A, a patient can have more than one thing wrong with them, and B, that there is a time domain to these disorders, and the easiest way is with otosclerosis. So, otosclerosis is traditionally a, it's traditionally a, sorry, husband interrupt us. Um, otosclerosis is traditionally a purely, a purely conductive hearing loss, but that's just how it starts. If it goes on long term, it eventually does grow into the cochlea and can create more of a mixed loss. Additionally, other things can happen to a person. They can be exposed to noise before the otosclerosis develops. They can be exposed to ototoxic medications. So otosclerosis, the base level is going to be a conductive level, a conductive disorder, but you need to find the thing that's going to make it mixed. If it's time domain, they need to be old. If it's something else, then you need to make it work out and make sense rationally for things that could logically happen to a patient. Noise-induced hearing loss, that is traditionally or predominantly what kind of hearing loss? Sensory neural, no air bone gap, right? Because it's the cochlea, it's the cochlear hair cells. None of the eardrum, ear canal, ear bones, middle ear space are impacted from most noise-induced hearing loss. Now, blast trauma could add that. So when you are designing your patients, you need to take these things into account. If you want your noise-induced hearing loss patient to be a mixed loss and have blast trauma, cool, you were allowed to do that. And then acoustic neuromas are what kind of loss? Again, sensory neural. And those are either sensory or those are more neural and maybe some sensory, but still no air bone gaps. What is a fistula though? A superior, is particularly a superior sensory, a superior semicircular canal dehiscence. Oh, those are magic. So you guys, what I need you to do after watching this PowerPoint is in your chat channel, put some references and some images of what an audiogram looks like for your disorder and put the references in the file section and again I would be get together and agree on a convention so that you could say like let's all name this you know disorder audiogram or something like that Additionally, if it is something that you can have a pre-treatment and a post-treatment for, you will need to explore what the audiograms look like for both the pre-treatment and the post-treatment, which that does bring me to back to a little bit to the otosclerosis mixed loss. That is one way that you can get a mixed loss from otosclerosis is a surgery that fails. So that is one of your options. 
Okay, so sound field testing, again, is for testing patients who cannot have inserts or headphones. It can be difficult to test children or cognitively impaired children. It might be hearing aid of verification because obviously you're not putting the headphones over the hearing aids. And it may be, that may be required by government entities who are behind the times because really is the right way to verify. And then also hearing protection device testing can also be done in sound field. But again, it only measures the better ear. It's also very touchy, fussy. Um, you'll learn more about it when you get into peds testing. But um, there's standing waves in the wall. If you're not exactly in the right space in the room, if you're not um, exactly at the right angle of azimuth, if you don't know if your booth is calibrated for zero degrees or 90, all of these things can make it a little bit more um, imprecise. Plus, you have to use warble tones to kind of counteract the standing waves a little bit, which means it's not as narrow of a tone. It's a lot. Plus, if you're using it for hearing aid verification, well, hearing aids are designed to do best for speech and pure tones and warble tones are not speech. It doesn't take into account the compression. It doesn't take into account the MPO. Basically speaking, if you can get ear specific headphone or insert specific thresholds, that's always gonna be better. For testing young children, you would do, whether it's sound field or other, otherwise, you're gonna have the ability to try and assess localization, and you're going to use VRA, CORE, CPA, TROCA, VROCA, or BOA. Um, BOA is behavioral observation audiometry. Even the best people at that are not super great. Like you can test a baby and people with BOA, because you're just looking for eye blinks and like flicks, um, you get a lot of variability there. Um, VROCA VR is visually reinforced operant conditioning audiometry um, as opposed to just visual reinforcement audiometry. So it's whether or not those OCAs are whether it's operant conditioning. And um, you'll learn more about these in your PEDS class or with Dr. Howard and Dr. Redding. Mostly you don't use these on adults, so. How do you bill these? Well, there are billing codes for those. There are these CPT codes that we talked about as we did in the otoscopy and cerumen section. So part of your assignments are to look up how much Medicare and Medicaid pays for these versus how much an audiometer costs. Um, but it's split between screening air only, which Medicare doesn't pay for at all, just threshold air conduction, just threshold air and bone. And then there are also um, modifier codes. So if you only do one ear, it's a dash 52. If you do extra stuff, it's dash 22. If it is distinct procedural services, so if you had a very good reason for why you didn't do a whole test, you would put the distinct procedural code. But most of the time, you're going to do the big daddy code and the big daddy code is comprehensive audiometry threshold evaluation and speech recognition and threshold which is 92553 and 92556 combined now it is actually billing fraud to bill these two codes when you ought to be billing that one you can't unbundle it you can't do that sort of stuff and if you need to do like, for instance, the only one of the few things that I could say would be, per, for instance, maybe you did air conduction um, threshold and SRT and word rec, but you didn't do bone conduction because maybe they'd had mastoid surgery or something and they literally couldn't tolerate it or they had a skin condition where you couldn't do it, something like that, you would use distinct procedural code. 
But when it comes to billing, we are ruled by medical necessity. And Medicare defines medical necessity as a service that is reasonable and necessary for the diagnosis or treatment of an illness or injury or to the improve the functioning of a malformed body member. It's got to be consistent with symptoms of the illness or injury, and it has to be provided within generally acceptable medical professional standards. It's not for mine or any other audiologist's convenience or of the convenience of the patient or anybody else's convenience. They only pay for tests and services that are medically necessary to diagnose, treat, and monitor a medical or surgical condition. So if your referral comes and it just says for hearing aids, the patient pays for that and not Medicare. So what are the steps or the outlines? Well, right now, and audiology obviously is fighting about this, it requires physician referral to be medically necessary. You have to have a symptom that goes along with it that maybe could be changed or needs to be monitored. Failure of a screening is also a good reason. The screening itself isn't covered, but if they do fail a screen, that is a diagnostically relevant reason. And then first times for hearing tinnitus or balance. And then after that, changes for same. You would also be able to do it for a determination of the effect of medication surgeries or treatment, either that the medication treatment or surgery is supposed to have made it better or if they had one that there's research that shows could cause hearing loss. So a person has heart attack and is in ICU and ventilated for several weeks. Well, those are a known situation to cause hearing loss. Usually they would also report symptoms though. Another thing would be um, diabetes and heart disease. Those are common to be correlated with hearing loss. More monitoring is appropriate there. Determining ototoxicity of medication. If they're on an ototoxic medication, it's medically, it could be medically necessary to do a baseline test and then over time monitoring. So those sorts of things. But the most important thing for keeping your behind out of the sling is to document, document, document. First step, document the referral. And that is for each incident. You can't have a standing order. If you're doing ototoxic monitoring, you need an order for the baseline, an order for the three month, order, order, order. And again, it cannot be for hearing aids, only a medical reason. And you personally, as the audiologist, when you're out, is responsible for documenting medical necessity. If a physician sends a referral that looks okay, but the patient does not give you a symptom that is conversant, and they just say, oh, I just want hearing aids, that's what you have to document, and that is not medical necessity, in which case Medicare doesn't pay. So... When you're writing the report in the case history, the first thing should be patient X was referred by Dr. Y due to whatever your medical reason. Don't give somebody an ex like don't make it hard for somebody to see what's going to keep your butt out of the sling. And then you can't just do every test in the battery just because they have that reason. That symptom must directly correlate to the test, and we will talk about that more. Now, currently, people fight a lot about whether tympanometry should just be routinely done, and I, as well as other experts in the field, not that I'm saying I'm an expert, but like billing experts, say that tympanometry shouldn't be done routinely. Um, if you're doing it, the case should be clear in your, in, your, um, in your report why you did tympanometry. And think about all these tests is, if I did this test, did it influence the diagnosis or treatment that is being provided? So when you're building your unfolding case studies, if there is a test and there's not a reason to do it, the fact that you didn't do it because there weren't any symptoms or that led to it is valid. 
Um, PQRS. We're going to kind of blow by this a little bit, but PQRS used to be so where we had to start with this, and it was Physicians Quality Reporting System. Um, it's a Medicare system. It's kind of our boss on this, and so what they're trying to do is assess or establish if different providers are doing things in a quality way. So we had PQRS and we had to bill and put these codes in and then it all went away and they assessed it and now we are going to have MIPS. So take a look at some of this stuff. Audiologists aren't required to do that right now, but in the next few years we probably will. And there are things like documentation of current medications. We have to review their medications for every evaluation. We need to talk about whether they use tobacco and if they do, giving them information about how to quit. If they're dizzy, they need referral to an ENT unless they're already with one. The depression one is weird. I never felt comfortable with that, but it was one of the options. MIPS has all of these different measures, um, but you have to actually do $90,000 a year in Medicare services, and most audiologists don't. And this is the website where you can go to get that information about what it is and to follow up. And our professional organizations are the ones who keep us updated on what we're required to do. Um, things that audiologists are definitely in, exempt from are the promoting interoperability and cost me measures. Those we probably won't ever be required to do. And here is a masking plateau, and I just want to kind of get it in your head. Also, we do them upside down starting at negative 10 compared to the book. So I kind of just wanted to point that out so that when you're seeing things, you get used to that. And here's an example of it. So I can just kind of, you can start thinking about it because in the next few weeks, we're going to do these. <laughs> 